as I, I think a bunch of you know that John spent part of last year um, at his sabbatical at Knox with me um, on the Galesburg Portrait Project, which was which is still in your studio, right? It's still over here, and it was um, it confirmed that uh, everybody should have a friend as good as John. Um, our friendship is one of got it. Now, as long as I don't sit on it. No, this um, our friendship goes back a long time, and uh, and it is one of the most significant in my life. I just take one opportunity. Everybody should be as lucky to have friends like this. So, I'm doing a dangerous thing, which is that I don't. It's, uh, there's two ways to do these for me, one of which is to really write things out and carefully um, prioritize a few ideas and only show the images that really relate to those ideas that demonstrate exactly what you're talking about. And sometimes I do that. But I also like the way these can be an opportunity for me to just look back at a bunch of stuff every few years. So every once in a while I do one this way, which is to just get a lot of images together. Um, so I went through stuff that I haven't looked at in years and years. And I just thought I will, uh, you know, and, and from, from my perspective now, there's things I see, patterns I see in my work that I wouldn't have seen even five years ago, and certainly not 10 years ago. Or so everywhere we get to be as an artist becomes a sort of a new vantage point that allows us to make connections, um, allows us to see into uh, some of our past thinking and exposes patterns. So that's what I'm going to do. And I hope um, I'm probably not going to talk about every image that, that, that I have. I will bounce across some of them. But I, you know, I'm hoping this will at least provide some context for you guys so that when you, you know, you've seen the work in the gallery, you'll have some way of understanding where that comes from, what it relates to, how my interests got to be as they are. Um, and, I'm, and along the way, I'll try to hit on four or five sort of important things, the big ideas, the sort of big shaping ideas for me as an artist over the years. Um, so I first started making sculpture, and this is not just going to be a long, long survey of everything I've made, I hope, but I just want to start here. This is one of the earliest things I ever made, and it is a steel sculpture. It's about, I think, 14 or 16 feet long, and it was made where I started college um, in 1976 in Minnesota, Bethel College. And like a lot of people who start, who got interested in sculpture, especially a lot of guys actually, who got interested in sculpture in the 1970s, um, I started by making, by welding. Everything was welding. Steel was sort of the default. It was the go-to for sculpture through much of the middle of the 20th century. It was to the 20th century, really, to at least a lot of American sculpture in the post-war period what marble and stone had been for the previous 3,000 years. Um, but um, there were a couple things going on, and I'll just take a minute to lay these out, because from what I'm realizing, and it, it doesn't really come as a surprise, uh, is that there are certain things at this moment, within these first couple years of my interest in art, that are so defining which become the kind of DNA, you know, they become your family lineage, those first few people who really expose you to art, um, who you connect with, they become like your art parents. Um, and you spend then the rest of your life uh, either running from them or towards them, or both. And at Bethel College there was an artist uh, by the name of Stu Luckman. And Stewart um, was an artist who worked very much in the mode of somebody like Anthony Caro. This is an Anthony Caro piece. Um, very, very spatial, welded steel sculpture um, that really engaged the environment, implicated a lot of space, um, um, and was quite elegant, actually, and very taut in its, uh, in its economy. Um, and now I'm going the wrong way. And 
I was extremely taken with his way of thinking about sculpture. It just burned a hole right through the center of my brain. It was that moment of really of both sort of trauma and revelation where your whole life turns and you go, this is what I'm doing. In fact, I'll just give you a really brief little story because I think it ends up being so important and I hadn't thought about it in a long time. The reason I took a sculpture class is because I had been a, I'd done a lot of photography in high school. I was a very uh, competent photographer when I came to college. And so this sculptor, Stuart, asked me if I would photograph a show of his with him at McAllister College. I knew nothing about sculpture, but I knew a lot about photography. And so for several days, I stood over a tripod with a, a camera you look down into, a large camera. Um, photographing his work with him, with him showing me exactly what I had to see. So it was a kind of forced looking, a forced education. He insisted that I see his work the way he does. So he'd say, now if you just move the camera this way a little bit, see how this and that align, you know, or see how the light's working on this, or you see how the space opens up as you move 10 feet in that direction. And it was the kind of education, um, it, was, it was almost coercive in a way. He insisted that I saw his work the way he does. And at the end of those three days, I had lost, um, and by the time we had then spent a couple days in the dark room printing these photographs, I was sort of no longer interested in photography. I was gonna be a sculptor. It was this transforming experience that was almost coercive in nature. Um, it's not a way I would ever teach somebody. It would never work today, but boy, did it work on me. Um, so this is one of the earliest things I made, and I'm, I'm showing it now because um, so much of what I did as a student, I now realize had no sort of spatial sense to it. It was really just about making an object rather than understanding that making an object is also to shape space. You know, it, in the same way that music, silence is part of music, right? We can't have music unless we have silence. The space between notes, the space around them. Music is spatial and the silence is the space. Um, sculpture is as much about space as it is about things. To, sh to shape an object is to also shape the space around an object or to have implications for the space around the object. Um, and I think I, I never really knew this as a student. It's not something I was capable of saying, but um, I did have an intuitive sense of it. And this is a, a steel sculpture I made a few years later in, uh, at Hope College. I transferred at some point after a long sojourn to a couple other places. Um, steel sculpture again. Now, the other thing that was really happening in about the mid-1970s when I got interested in sculpture is that the, the kind of residue from a big thing that it was happening in art in the 1960s called minimalism. Well, minimalism was a huge, huge disruptive sort of traumatic idea in, in art. Um, and by the early 1970s, mid-1970s, it had sort of trickled down to colleges in the Midwest. Um, you know, the word minimalism, now you see it, you know, used in, on Pinterest to talk about flower arrangements and shoes and all sorts of things. Um, but minimalism, as, as it was really conceived and as defined by its, its protagonists, by the, the people who really um, concept, philosophically uh, constructed and defended it, um, was a whole really part of a philosophical worldview. And its goal, this is a, a a, a sculpture, a, a single work really, by Donald Judd, who is by far the most uh, important, articulate, and uh, vehement protagonist of minimalism. Um, the goal of minimalism was really to empty out all of the sort of categories of meaning 
and making and thinking about art that art had, that, that had been com common to art in the 20th century through um, the Enlightenment, through the great humanist traditions of art, from the European traditions. And minimalism really is trying to create a completely, a, 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 wants to wipe the slate clean. It's a deeply anti-historical movement. And on a young brain that was also studying philosophy at the time, I was a philosophy major before I discovered art, it was, it was an infectious, exciting idea that you could really start over. It's such an American idea too, right? We're gonna start over. We're gonna do this whole new thing. We're gonna throw out all that European crap, you know? All that sort of existential anxiety, all those spiritual aspirations, all of the uh, intuitive sort of meanderings that artists do. Um, and we're going to reduce art, said minimalists, to something which is sort of irrefutably concrete and true. We're going to let, we're going to make art that is just, it's going to simply be the only thing we can really know. You know, it's, there will be no speculation involved. And so minimalists said, I mean, Donald Judd is famous, my flashlight's on. That's weird. Here, fix this. Um, thanks, John. Um, minimalists uh, really would said, I mean, it's not, not virtually, they did say over and over again that art means nothing that an object is not capable of carrying, of hosting any kind of meaning, and that um, the search for meaning in art ultimately is, uh, is itself a fallacy, is a fool's errand. And that an object is first of all and only what it is. The only thing you can really say about a plywood box is that it's four feet tall and six feet square and that there may be a particular kind of experience you would have from it based on its size and its physical properties, but please don't waste your time interpreting it or talking about meaning of any sort. The whole language of meaning and value um, and the aspirational language that we associate with art of spirituality and uh, all of that is something minimalists really wanted to eradicate. Minimalism is really, um, as a philosophy major at the time, I recognized that it was exactly a parallel for what philosophers call logical positivism, which was to reduce um, language to a kind of object that also is drained of meaning. Is that an adequate description? <laughs> um, and so on the one hand, I was really, really drawn to minimal art. I loved the idea of it. I loved what it did. I loved the reduction of form. I loved the geometry. But as a Christian, and I was thinking about my work in those terms, at least from time to time. You know, it's not something I did consistently as a student. but. I did reflect on what I was doing as an artist in light of sort of my emerging sense of what my values really were. And I had to ask myself, you know, how can this claim that art is really meaningless, um, how can that hold up against the kind of values that I, that I think the purpose of art should be to elevate us as humans and to extend the work of creation in some way? ultimately to contribute goodness to the world in some way. Um, and this became sort of an ongoing battle for me. Um, I think ultimately that question, I think really in the last five years or so, um, I've begun to perhaps come to terms with, uh, with that answer to that question. I had always been a real maker. I love making things. I mean, as a kid, I just made a lot of stuff. And um, uh, so a lot of what I did was, was really based on sort of exploring materials and trying different ways of putting things together. Um, this is a set of these sort of very reduced walking stick kind of forms that are made in 
bronze and steel and different kinds of woods, but they're a serial kind of, a, a series of identical things made in different materials. Um, I love just the process of making. This is a piece that I made in my junior year of college, and it's a steam bent redwood and ash. Um, it's about 16 feet tall, it's a huge thing. But I loved um, the kind of project that this was, you know, of making the tools to steam bend the wood and milling the wood and all of those things. And there is um, a rather you know, in, at Hope College at the time, like a lot of Midwestern colleges, the emphasis was really on how we make things, on sort of the material refinement, on doing things well, on fitting things together well, on craft, ultimately. Um, nobody really talked much about what I would now say are the sort of big um, conceptual or formal issues of art, the things that really motivate me as an artist now. We talked a lot about how do you make stuff and um, thought about it a lot as material, mostly. Um, and when I got to graduate school, people began saying things about, about the, how good I was at making things. They would say, um, oh, that's going to be a problem for you. You know, that's, um, your, you know that, your, your love of craft, of making things right, that's really going to be a, an issue. Um, and I began to realize there was this sort of tension between the world I had moved into and the world that I left. Um, and the kind of, I, as a result, I started making things that were much more direct, um, that is, which were more frankly, more um, sort of openly put together, not trying to hide the way things go together, things that would kind of narrate their own making. So um, this is a, a, from a series of things made with um, fluorescent lights, um, steel, cast plaster. This is another one. I think um, I'm going to skip over this. This is going to go way too long if I don't move. And by the time I graduated, I was, I had made these very reduced objects, kind of um, almost like fragments of architectural ar archetypal architecture, like a corner of a building or a section of a wall or a piece of how a floor is made. Um, I was really beginning to explore m making as a kind of language. Um, and I think realizing what I, what I would now say is that um, the way we make things shapes how we think. We think, um, and the way we think can determine how we make things. So thinking and making are very, very related. I, and I think much of my work ultimately has been about trying to find a way of keeping those things fully um, organically engaged so that we can't even find, make a distinction between making and thinking. Um, so, um, and as a result, the things I make are very much found through their making. They're not designed or conceived of and then executed. And this is a, this to me is a really, really important uh, one of these big ideas, I think. The first, the first big idea I would give you is that sculpture is as much about space as it is about form and matter. The second idea I would give you is that um, making is a way of thinking. And because we live in a world which, in which stuff is mostly produced for us and is mostly designed before it's made, you know, this whole idea of design, right, is something that really comes up with the Industrial Revolution, if you look at it. And if we really ask ourselves, what do we mean by designing something, what we're really talking about is separating the conception of its form from making the material object, right? So to design something is intellectual work or visual work, and to make it is physical material work of the hands and the body. 
And this separation, right, between the body and the mind, the elevation of intellectual and mental work in our culture as opposed to physical work, is something that I would, that I think art can sort of pick away at, that we can get us to think differently about that. And so, um, there, for me, there is, you know, I don't, I never conceive of something and then make it. I don't do drawings and then make things. It is all part of a similar process. So that making, yeah, I'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, when I, at this, at my opening for my thesis show, at, 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 this was at Yale, an artist who I greatly, greatly admired, a famous artist, one of the people I went to Yale to study with, took me out uh, for dinner after the show, and, and uh, one of the, I just, I'll never forget the thing he said. He, um, ultimately, he said, he said, I, I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but the idea was you can't keep doing this. <laughs> He says, I like what you're trying to do, but it's completely unsustainable. You can't keep yourself interested as an artist doing that. And I fought him for a long time, and I, now I recognize that he's right. Um, that it was sort of going down a rabbit hole into further reduction and a, a, a kind of critical um, exclusion of possibilities. My, um, I think a lot of my work inherited a kind of a puritanical intellectual habit to keep limiting possibilities. In other words, and this is deep in the history of abstraction, by the way, the idea of sort of reduction and ultimately excluding things rather than thinking of increasing the set of possibilities, always reducing the set of possibilities. Um, and somebody who really helped, me, uh, along the way there's been some really, really important encounters, people who have um, almost literally taken me from one way of thinking and moved me and said, here, try this. Here's a new way of thinking about this. The first one I mentioned was Stuart Luckman. Probably the second one is the artist Jessica Stockholder. Some of you may know that name, but she's a very major artist who now runs the, uh, the visual arts department at the University of Chicago. And Jessica and I worked together very closely in graduate school. We did collaborative work. Um, I ended up writing her first catalog. Um, but um, she had, th through the few pieces we did together, and then um, um, through following her work and just very intermittent conversations over many years, um, and, and some exchanges over my work in the studio while in graduate school, she was one of the people who really produced a huge shift in my thinking. Um, I think sometimes we need people who can do this for us, you know, we don't always get there on our own. The way we, you know, the way progress happens is collaborative. Um, this is a well-known Jessica Stockholder piece from the early 1980s for Mary Heilman. This is an, another piece. It was also through, I think, initially, I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but I think it was through m my interest in her work and working with, with her um, that I really took hold of color in my work, that I started thinking of myself uh, as sculpture as something that could really use color. And it took a while after this. This is a, a large installation from, uh, at the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk, Muse Norfolk, Virginia from 1989, my own. This is called Plato's Retreat, by the way. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> little, yeah, Plato's Retreat is too. There's a little on, double entendre there. Anyway, very large platonic forms rolling around on tables and things that might be bed frames and which relate to the sort of neoclassical architecture of the museum itself. But I think here I'm really is the beginning of really thinking spatially about sculpture. Rather than thinking of shape, simply shaping objects, I'm thinking about how those objects shape the space um, that we enter into. And this is an, another sort of huge idea in sculpture that I'm just recently kind of coming back to, I think, that. 
sculpture creates a spatial arena which um, can be social in nature, which can be political in nature. Um, it is not simply an object which is isolated from us. I'm going to skip over some of these. So there's always been, I'll say this, there's always been sort of two strains in my work, sort of two parallel channels going on. One of which I would describe as tending towards a kind of hermetic, that is almost reclusive um, reduction, that's always excluding possibilities, is always trying to get leaner and, um, and uh, sort of more reduced. And this is an example of that. This is a group of, of um, objects, freestanding slabs. They're actually hollow veneer slabs, each one about seven feet tall, which are paintings. They are both sculptures and paintings, essentially. They're extremely abstract um, objects. Um, I should just mention it. So the third thing that happened to me, in my, sort of the third encounter in my life that was really, really hugely um, mind-bending for me was that I, um, through, and I, I won't go into uh, tell you how, but I ended up working for the estate of, the, of Piet Mondrian, the Dutch modernist, the great high priest of abstraction. Um, I assume you guys know Mondrian. But um, while at Hope, in my last year at Hope, or actually after I graduated, I met the executor of the estate, who, was, who had been a very close friend of Mondrian's, brought Mondrian to New York in 1940, um, um, spent four intense years with him until his death four years later, um, and was closer to Mondrian than anybody. And, and who himself was an important artist. The artist's name is Harry Holtzman. He, he has work in the modern and things. And he was a, a he himself was a really founding member of, of American, the American Abstract Artists Association. Um, my wife and I ended up living on his estate with him for a year during my last year of graduate school. And at night, I would go downstairs, and Harry had this huge palatial estate, like Architectural Digest came and did it. He made a lot of money from Broadway Boogie Woogie. But um, we would talk, and he would just tell, he would just let go of these stories he had. So he would tell me stories about, um, you know, just these iconic artists, um, people who I'd grown up with in the art history books, Ed Reinhardt and Robert Motherwell, and he would talk about. Mondrian at length, and he would talk about his own sort of philosophical um, ideas about abstraction. Um, and it was, it connected me. I, I think I got connected to history in this really immediate way. You know, it was this direct human connection to that history um, that just, again, burrowed into my brain. And I've, I, I think that that has been huge. Um, and pieces like this are really, um, are that, that part of me. Um, there's a lot of work I've done that has to do with the intersection of painting and sculpture and drawing, just sort of odd um, eccentric objects with paint on them. Some go on the wall, some don't. Now a lot of these Two, um, well, okay. um, I, over the years I've done a lot of installation work, very large pieces that are made for a specific place or um, by virtue of their scale need to be site specific. This is actually um, reclaiming, uh, I, would, I would often make big works for installation and then cut them up and make something else with them. and cut them up again and make something else out of them. So a lot of this work is, uh, you're seeing the same stuff over and over, in fact. I'm gonna skip over this. This is a, not my own. I came to a point in about, um, 
uh, about five years after graduate school, where I got really bored with what I was capable with with everything I was making. I just I felt like I was at a complete impasse, and I wanted something that would that um, that felt that rocked and you know that was rock and roll basically. I had been I felt like I'd been listening to Philip Glass for the last decade and I wanted to rock and roll. I wanted to do something that was robust, that, you know, that moved, that was that felt cool, basically. And so this is this other side of my work that I vacillate back and forth from. It, you know, the one is the extremely refined, kind of classical, abstract, reduced, hermetic, has nothing to do with life. Um, and the other is kind of rock and roll, you know. So this is a, a or more Baroque, you could say, too. It's much more complex. Um, it's harder to sort out. Um, I started making these huge objects out of wood and canvas. So this is like a 16-foot long bicycle that was this tall. You know, it's like this huge, stupid bicycle. <laughs> I mean, it's like a dumb thing. But I knew I was, yeah. yeah, so I knew I was, I knew I was making it to cut it up. And um, this is called um, Umberto's Crash after <laughs> Boscioni, because it struck me, it relates to futurism, Umberto Boscioni. But, um, yeah, so I started making these huge objects in order to cut them up because I wanted something that would really interrupt my ability to plan. You know, I, on the one hand, you, if, you're, if you decide you're not going to design your work before you make it, you still need a way to start, you know. You still have to have somehow, like, what do I do to start? You know, you can't just start without anything in your head because that feels pointless, right? So. I just needed a reason to make a huge thing, and I thought, a bicycle. Just because it had sort of the diversity of form in it. I like bicycles. I like the idea of taking something that was thin and skinny and turning it into something that was huge and stocky. And I love the way this thing just turns in space. This was a, a huge trombone. I did a couple versions of trombones. I also did guitars, but the problem with the guitar is that it's too loaded with art history, you know, Picasso's guitars. Um, but I did uh, rocking chairs. And that really loosened me up, I gotta say. Um, and this is while I was in uh, an, early, an early teaching job. And one of the things that teaching does for you is that it, um, it forces you to um, um, well, it, 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 it forces you to question all your assumptions and makes you want to run from them, to not get too locked into your own thinking. And so this is me really trying to loosen up. So I, I'm just going to run through these. These are just, um, these are really a good example of, in, of, of objects which are not at all conceived. I mean, they start by coming up with just a collection of material. They're very much like drawings in their kind of offhandedness, the lightness with which they're made. Their, their forms are entirely found or intuited through their making. Um, you know, they're made of like very light scraps of plywood, plaster, sheet metal, pieces of black rubber in one case nuts and bolts, foam, carpeting. Um, one of them had Cheetos in it, I know. You know, they, they, everything, everything. Um, so this is, of course, this, this kind of, this way of thinking and, and working with materials um, couldn't be more different than the sort of, you know, the pure, reductivist sort of tendencies that were my other side. In fact, you could almost, um, you know, there was, there's no dominant material here. There's no material that sort of holds the whole thing up. 
there's no real hierarchy, there's no real logic to its making. It's a completely sort of irrational way of making things. Um, behind these objects, which sit on these sort of crudely made pedestals, there are um, cast plaster slabs with colored wax poured over them, encaustic wax. Um, and so each of these is really a kind of diptych, or a, a work in two pieces. The slabs on the wall, which in some ways are more sculptural than the sculpture itself. They have a weight to them, a physical weight. They weigh, you know, 100 pounds a piece, some of them. Um, whereas the objects themselves are like drawings. They're quite ephemeral. They're really space-filled. There's nothing there that weighs much. And I like that, I was playing with that kind of reversal of, of the weight of the... So I'm going to run through a, a series of very, f really quickly here, wall pieces that I've done over the years. This is not mine, that's a Joel Shapiro. Um, throughout all of this, I have always kept making these, I, th I think, somewhat eccentric and um, odd things that hang on the wall that are, that are, on the one hand, they are an optical experience, like in a, or a, a visual, a wholly visual experience like you would have of a painting. You can read them as color, as a kind of image, um, but they are also um, really assert themselves as things, as objects. You know, they're wood, they're plaster, they have a definite kind of weight to them. They're undeniable in their objectness. So they are both, you know, in the sense that our experience of color, for instance, is largely ephemeral, you know. Color is always changing. We never really can grasp it. Um, but the object itself, of course, like minimalists would say, is only a thing. It is ultimately a concrete reality. We can weigh it. We can drop it on our toe and it'll hurt, you know. Color is this other thing. It's, it's, it has a, a kind of a meta presence, you know, a detached, a disembodied kind of presence. Um, and this, all of these wall pieces are very much about the tension between those two things, between something which we know um, as as an in fact. We know it to be a thing in the world and then the kind of shiftiness of optical, of, of, of visual perception, of optical perception, of color, of light, of shadow. And I, th I think a lot of my work has to do with the play between those two things. So these, some of these, like, you know, this is mahogany painted with latex over here, yeah, and cast plaster. Um, these are also wooden structures with plaster and uh, paint. Do you, do you still have this piece? Oh, okay. I stole it back. I stole it back. I like that. These are some much larger, these are sort of torso size, these tend to be about like this. And they're plywood, about four inches thick, layered plywood. And they really move off the wall. I mean, these, they, from, the, from the wall, they, may, they might extend out a couple of feet, sort of um, holding themselves off the wall like gymnasts or something. They're rather athletic in their relationship to the wall, so they cast shadows on the wall. Um, but again, you know, this on the one hand, you, the plywood edge, you, it is what it is. You see it for exactly what it is. And on the other hand, the color um, is dead, is completely matte. So you see no reflection on it, really, or anything. You're unaware of its physical surface or even as a physical presence. So the color becomes almost detached from the object itself. The whole idea that color can be a thing um, of its own, something not hosted by a physical object is quite interesting to me. 
Um, this is another set of little objects. These are little boxes. They're all based on a 10 inch cube. They're made out of wood. They're hollow, made out of poplar and plywood, and they're all covered with linen. The linen that artists, that painters use, has a lot of historical weight to it, and uh, with oil and wax. And they're plays, you know, there's, in some cases, can you see these? Yeah. You know, so some of these lines may just be lines that are incised in the surface, in the wax and in the oil, drawn. Others of these lines may be lines where the linen comes together, where the fabric has a seam in it. And still others of the lines might actually be parts of the puzzle, you know, where, where one side of the object, one piece of the thing meets another. So they're always conflating the kind of visual logic with the, with the mechanical logic, if that makes sense. They're, um, you, they're a little bit like Rubik's Cubes, you know? But imagine a Rubik's Cube where only half the lines actually do anything and the others are there to confuse you. Oh, wrong way. All right. Yeah, so I make a, I, I, I just have a practice of making a lot of these wall pieces. And I, I think I've done this now for 30 years, made these little odd wall pieces. Um, these are very much, you know, what I was saying about thinking and making, right? These are entirely found through their making. I, I do start with the drawing, but the drawing is on the wood. And then I start cutting out wood. So it's literally like taking a drawing as you work and sort of folding it into space and bending it and attaching other things to it. So there's, the drawing becomes the object. Um, and, in, and in that way, they're entirely discovered. I, have, I know very, very little about them before I start them. Um, I, at the same time, they're very calculating. You know, there's a lot of, there, there is a lot of kind of thinking, calculating thought that goes into them, but it happens, uh, that is woven into the process of their making. So they're like paintings on the one hand, again, they're they are, they have a kind of an optical charge to them. They play with illusion a little bit. Um, they play with perspective, with the conventions of perspective, without actually representing anything in perspective. Um, they sort of, they're slippery. They slide in and out of the, a, a kind of painter's, um, what painters call the picture plane, out of a perspectival space. Um, but they are also things. They're like model airplanes almost. They're very light plywood. They're, they're just wooden boxes. So I like, I like their mundaneness, like it's this wooden box that's also becomes this, is capable of transforming itself into uh, this slippery, elusive, ephemeral experience of light and color. And they're very much about the logic of their making, the kind of logic of how things fit together. And the way there's a, I'm, in, I'm really interested in the kind of slippage or the misalignment between a mechanical logic of making, that is how you literally make two things fit together, and a, something which I would just call a visual logic, that is how do things fit together um, as, as form which is a different question. And I like the way when those two things sort of rub against each other and slip against each other. Um, we, I'm sorry, this has gone on too, much too long already. Um, I'm gonna skip over all of this. So the pieces um, back here, I love this by the way, this was a show in a, in a house a house gallery in Indiana, and I just love the way these look in a domestic setting, like, like you're, you know, like a family waiting around for dinner. Um, these, uh, all of these pieces, which I, I call singers, or I was initially calling the choir, or the chorus, 
they are partly a. Um, I, I started making these after a really after my dad died, actually. And I thought a lot about who he was. He was a huge influence in my life. He was somebody who mattered, not just to me, but to a lot of people. And he was a man of tremendous um, sort of stamina and steadfastness. He was a, a bit stoic in his outlook. He survived the war. He was deeply committed to ideas which he spent his life defending. He was deeply committed to his faith. And I realized, you know, I, I started thinking about how much of the history of, of my own work and so much of modern sculpture especially is actually about a sense of things in a state of flux, always shifting, the sands always moving. You know, the, the, the major agenda for modernist sculpture coming from Cubism is one of things of fracture and shift and uh, disruption, things always in a state of motion. Um, and I started thinking about Egyptian sculpture, you know, and that they wanted something that would stay, that was about staying in one place, about eternity, about a, kind, a different kind of commitment, um, something that was really committed um, to its own, to, to being, to a sense of being, you know, that was deeply affirmative. And I don't, you know, a lot of my work, I think, has ultimately been my interest in making is largely about a, a process of what I would call doubting and affirming. You know, when you take two things and you stick them together, construction, which is what, how most sculpture is made, it's a kind of binary motion. You have this thing and that thing and you put them together. And there's something, you could say there's this kind of an, an affirmative gesture there. We're making something bigger out of these two things. But there's also always a kind of doubting, right? Where you then take that and you cut it another way and you turn it over and you, is that really what I want to do? No. So it's this process of doubt and affirmation that for me I think is at the bottom of the way I make. And it, in that way it becomes, it can become very, almost a game of being of making clever decisions like a putting piece moving pieces on a table sometimes and i wanted to make something start something that really bypassed all of that that was that was um, um, an affirmative act in a way that i think i had not done before and this, I mean, this ultimately comes down, I, I think, to, you know, wanting to reach for something that I, more elemental. Because, you know, after, I mean, I've sort of been around the block. I've made a lot of weird stuff. And you get to a point where you ask, you know, what, what matters? Is there any urgent reason to make what I'm making? Is there anything that makes it really necessary for me? And I think those are the questions you ask when you lose somebody like your father, you know, at my age. And so I wanted to start work that felt necessary in that way, that reached to something, in a kind of elemental need, and that maybe connected my own process of making, you know, to those sort of deep human connections you know, Stonehenge, monuments of all sorts, things that are made to just mark a presence in a place and time. And um, I think, you know, with, after all the sort of theorizing about sculpture that I, that I can get interested in and it leads me by the nose all over, in the end, what's I think most important to me is the idea that, you know, the making the act of making is fundamentally good. It is to extend it, the work of creation, you know? That's my job, that's what we're here for. To, um, to expand a space of beauty and delight, and that that's really all the theory I think I need, actually. Um, and that it is the work of artists to expand um, 
into the places of darkness and fear and to displace those things by um, creating a world of vibrant um, goodness. And so vibrancy is sort of my new gig, if you will. Um, as much as I respect artists who, you know, want their work to do good in the world by, through, through an agenda, by some kind of social action, by delving into political ideas, social ideas and things, it's, um, it's just not where I find myself. I, I, I think it's important from my perspective that art does not take on a, what I would call a kind of an instrumental agenda, that art doesn't um, try to be a tool at anybody's disposal for, for pursuing an agenda, but that art remains a place of intrinsic goodness, a thing that we love for its own sake. I think it teaches us how to rejoice in good things for the sake of good things, not because we are trying to accomplish anything else with it. And uh, I have many artist friends who would, uh, who would uh, be appalled to hear me say that. So that's, uh, when did we start? Like 10 after maybe, sorry. It's much longer than I intended. Any questions I can, comments? Yeah, Janine. One thing that kept kind of popping up through your whole talk was the place, it kind of went back when you were talking about the Industrial Revolution. And oh, yeah. The, okay, that shift of making and design. Yeah, and then the I separation was, of, of thought and action in some yeah. ways. Okay, and then I was thinking, okay, making before that had a lot to do with function. We so, also had, you know, for yeah. functionality. I'm thinking of farmers and what you need. Absolutely. To do. Now, so that idea of function kept trailing me yeah. through as you talked. What is there a connection? And then, as you ended up with this art being almost separate from function, yeah. it's just there to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm and then I deeply, thought of something yeah. you didn't bring up, but this other life you had <laughs> you know that. as a functional <laughs> maker. And I didn't know how. Do those two worlds ever yeah. art and function? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark well, furniture. Beautiful. Yeah, I spent about 20 years Upstairs, making furniture for a living. Um, yeah, they do. I mean, I, I made an effort for much of my life to keep those two things separate, honestly, because I never had an and interest. And are they still separate in your head? Um, Yes and no. I mean, they crash from time to time. Um, I think these wall, those little wall pieces that are so carefully constructed, I think the sense of kind of rational fit with how things go together there, the sense of an ordered fittingness, mm -hmm. and, a, and a play with that, mm -hmm. like a sense that things maybe fit, but they also just don't, you know? Um, I think that comes out of my experience in furniture making and things. What's interesting about furniture making to me, a lot of my thinking about design and, and has, has come from, from that because um, there I did have to design things and then make them. Um, but you know, if you think of the chair, for instance, the chair is a perfect example of this, right? Until, until sometime around 1890, 1880, the chair was entirely the product of the craftsperson who made the chair. It was designed by its maker. Um, it's not until you actually get architects thinking about furniture. Um, you know, people like Adolf Loos. I mean, the Germans are the really guilty ones here. Um, uh, yeah, huh? Yeah, but you know, until you get architects designing furniture or furniture that's designed for production. So some things that happen even in the 1870s with the, the iconic little cafe chair. But it is ultimately, I mean, even those things are designed originally by their makers, by cabinet makers, by furniture makers. It's not until you get architects designing furniture that you really have that separation. You know, so Frank Lloyd Wright designs furniture that is built by somebody else. Um, Otto Wagner, I mean, there's, and that, that so, that separation of sort of material production from c conception. I think, is, I think there is a role of art to sort of, um, sort of, 
I would, I would say, critically prosecute that division in, in contemporary culture. And the function is kind of a different... I think function is sort of a different set of questions in a way. Yeah, my own view is that function and art are not, those, those, are, um, it, those are not mutually exclusive categories by any like means. Like a, a lot of art can be, chair. well, a lot of art can be, there's a lot of, yes, there's a lot of great functional objects that are also happen to be great art. But that isn't what this is. There's, yeah, it's just not what I'm yeah. doing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In other words, I don't think of those as opposing, as competing categories. Some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> Thank you. This is really. Um, when you were talking about sort of the frames of your work, yeah, and you played this opposition of yeah the classicist, the cool, the minimalist, the rational, rational, yeah, and then that bicycle piece blew my mind. I just love that. Emily's my witness. Okay. I said, that's a bicycle. <laughs> uh, the seat gives it away pretty right, quick. Right. It's interesting. Without the seat, it could just be circles. Sure, and sure. Yeah. But then the way that you talked about that was rock and roll, and you wanted to... Yeah, I just wanted the kind of robust experiences. So, so a philosophical reference you hadn't made, but sounds like it, uh -huh. you're, you're, you're embodying it, is um, you're sort of living in Nietzsche's birth of tragedy, right? You're, yes. You're being yeah. Apollo and Dionysian. Yeah, yeah, the Apo okay. Apollonian and the Dionysian, yep. yeah. And I wonder how this... Romantic in the classic. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, this later move of art as affirmation. Yeah. How that plays into that, that story. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So the more, the most, imp I think these are ultimately quite romantic, um, in in my spectrum of things. You know, if 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 that's the dichotomy we get to work with, um, particularly these the five pieces in there that are clay, actually. You know, that are that are modeled in clay. You know, working, and I, I wish I had left time, I'm sorry, you guys, but um, if you want, we'll do another talk, which will be over at 8.30. <laughs> on, uh, um, clay is a completely different way of thinking about making. You know, this idea that making and thinking determine each other. So the reason I started working in clay is because I have spent my entire life basically constructing you know, taking this thing, whether it's wood or steel, and joining it to that thing. And it really is a kind of binary thinking, you know. If we've got this, you're either putting things together or you're cutting them apart, basically. Those are your options. Um, it's also very, a kind of hierarchical way of thinking, you know. So in other words, you might do one or two actions in, when you're making something out of wood that really are fully determining of the form. I cut out a piece of wood and stick it to another piece of wood, and that's the form. Whereas with the clay, you know, it's an entirely incremental process. So every action is, is the same as every other action. And it's literally taking a pinch, you know, doing that 20,000 times until it's six feet tall. And every time you put down a piece of clay, you are, you are making a decision a little piece of the determinant decision about the form of the thing. So it, it's, a, it's a process that's without the same kind of hierarchies intellectually and materially. And of course, it is very, it's direct contact. There's no tools involved in the making of those. You know, I, I also want something that really reached back to the sort of this elemental human act. You know, I mean, clay, think of it. The first objects humans probably ever made were probably made of clay. You know, like reaching down, grabbing some mud, and look, it's a dog. <laughs> or whatever. Um, you know, so I, I, but I wanted something where I couldn't, first of all, that would disrupt all my skills. Um, I wanted to undermine all those things that I'm so good at, measuring and cutting and getting everything lining up and looking just, you know, I just, I was just done with that. I just wanted something that was com like learning to play a new instrument. It would be like playing the violin all through your life and then deciding suddenly you're going to switch to oboe. That's Because um, I think it's really important. I think we don't really change as artists or grow, for that matter, as people, without a kind of trauma of some sort. You know, something that undermines everything we know, that shifts, that, shifts, that, that shakes up our world. Do you do 
material sidestep and then that changed the register of everything else. Yeah, it does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and just having to learn that like a child, you know, like how do you make mud stand up? So I think I think in the way that yeah, I, th I mean, it doesn't really answer your question, but it's an interesting one, yeah. Are you guys familiar with that? The, the birth of tragedy, Nietzsche? Sure you're you should, you need to read that. What you should do is read Rothko's, um, what's Rothko's little book about art? Mark Rothko wrote this little book about art about this thick. I can't remember the name of it right now. But he talks all about the birth of tragedy. It, it's, that is the seminal text in his mind and the mind of a lot of mid-century mid artists. It's your mom. Huh? It's your mom. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, I'm done. <laughs>